Good evening. Welcome to tonight's James Gregory Public Lecture on Science and Christianity. For those of you who do not, do not know me, my name is Andrew Torrance. I am project leader for the program that is running this series of James Gregory Lectures. Before I introduce this evening's speaker, I would like to say just a few words about this program. It is called Scientists and Congregation Scotland, and it is being run through Mary's School of Divinity, headed up by Professor Ivor Davidson, director of the program, along with myself. Also, it is being funded by a generous grant from the John Templeton Foundation. As many of you will know, the primary role of this program is to enable churches throughout Scotland to develop projects that will encourage constructive dialogue between the church and the scientific world. We are excited to have recently received 25 grant proposals from 31 churches across Scotland, from churches that are eager to promote constructive conversation about faith and science within the life of the church. If you're interested in learning more about this program, please visit our website at www.siscotland.org. On this site, you'll also find an exciting list of some of the upcoming James Gregory lectures. Also connected with these lectures is a new branch of Christians in Science, which is being headed up within the university by Dr. Rebecca Goss, Joshua Sharp, and myself. If you are interested in being involved with this, or indeed, if you are interested in hearing about future James Gregory lectures, please fill in one of the forms that are up here at the front. Now, to introduce this evening's speaker. Reverend Dr. Mark Harris is a lecturer and course manager of the Master's Programme in Science and Religion at the University of Edinburgh. This is the role for which most of his life has prepared him coming to it with an impressive background in both physics and theology. Dr. Harris received his degree and PhD in Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge. However, following his studies, he soon transitioned to become an expert on condensed matter physics. During his time as a physicist, he became renowned for being one of the co-discoverers of spin ice, an amazing model system that has revolutionized research into magnetism. Following his active period as a scientist, he was ordained as a priest in the Church of England. He then became actively involved in church ministry for 10 years, culminating in his becoming vice provost, canon, and presenter at St. Mary's Cathedral in Edinburgh. With his diverse background, he has published broadly in the areas of physics, biblical studies, and science and religion. He has recently published a book, The Nature of Creation, Examining the Bible and Science. I've left my copy up here at the front for anyone who's interested in having a look at it. It is a tremendous privilege and a huge honour to have Reverend Dr. Harris join us this evening to engage with the question, do the miracles of Jesus contradict science? Thank you very much, Andrew, for that wonderful uh, introduction. And also thank you to all of you for being here on this wonderful afternoon on Easter Monday. I feel so honored that you decided to come, come indoors and listen to me. I do hope I give you some reason, some justification for having taken the decision to, to stay indoors. I must also let you into a bit of a secret about my title, Do the Miracles of Jesus Contradict Science. I have to admit that I was very nervous when given this title by Professor Eric Priest to speak to, because what I've written about so far has mostly been in the Hebrew Bible. I feel a bit more comfortable there. Although I am working up a pro book project on the resurrection, so I, I feel as though I'm getting there. But in preparing this and, and agreeing to write to this title, I've done quite a lot of thinking through. Now, another part of this secret that I'm letting you into is that I feel quite nervous about questions that beg either a yes or a no. And I always tell my students when they come and ask for advice on their um, essays to choose for a course, uh, sorry, titles to choose for a course, they say, 
Don't choose something that's a yes or no answer. It will lead you down a direction you probably don't want to go. Choose something more nuanced. Well, actually, in thinking through what I, what I hope to say to you, I've actually decided the fact that this isn't actually um, such a bad title after all. And this question, yes or no, is actually about the best uh, you know, way of phrasing it I could have found, particularly because the answer I want to put to you is both a yes and a no. Not yes or no, not a maybe or a perhaps, but yes and no. Now, this may sound rather opaque, rather vague. I will hope to give you some reasons why yes and no is actually the best and the most robust answer to this question. I'm not being a vague or woolly person. I don't think I am. Please let me know if, if at the end you think I am. Um, why do I say yes and no? Well, I've got some 50 minutes or so to explain. I'll just give you a very quick recap. Firstly, um, the field that I work in, biblical scholarship, and particularly how it relates to the science religion debate, has done a lot to teach us that the texts on which the, the ideas, the stories of the miracles of Jesus are based are actually really very subtle to understand. <coughs> They're far more complex than being just simple matter-of-fact reports of what might really have happened, which means there's much more going on in reading and understanding than simply asking yourself, well, do I believe this happened or not? Does it contradict science or not? The second aspect of this is that miracle is where science and religion hit head on, becomes more or less the same thing, really. It's one of the most contested areas of debate in the science religion field. So for those two reasons, biblical scholarship, miracle being where science and religion um, hit each other, I think it's appropriate that the answer here is both a yes and a no. Um, I'll give you a quick summary of my talk. First of all, I'm going to just speak in brief terms about what the science and religion field is, as I see it, and how I have got into it. Secondly, I'll spend quite some time over this question, what is a miracle? Which actually turns out to be much more difficult than you might imagine. It's one of the hardest questions to answer in um, philosophy and theology. Before moving on to, well, what are the miracles of Jesus? That turns out not to be so straightforward either. And then the, the question that is at the heart of my talk, do the miracles of Jesus contradict science? This is where I will start leaning into a kind of yes and no answer. And finally, in the last few minutes, I'll talk a little bit about um, a very active growth area in biblical studies known as the historical Jesus. And how is this relevant to thinking through the miracles of Jesus? First of all, a little bit of autobiography, um, filling in some of the blanks that Andrew left there. Bottom right, you can see my current workplace, New College, Edinburgh, fantastic place to work, just beneath the castle. Um, but for most of my career as a scientist, I was actually working at a place, the top left, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory near Oxford, which is one of the main government-funded institutions for large-scale experimental and computational facilities in the UK. So it exists largely to, to, to house um, large and expensive experiments that individual universities generally wouldn't be able to uh, manage. So, the day-to-day -day job would involve working with teams who had travelled from all over the world to use our facilities, many of which were um, world-leading. So in front of the picture, you can see the diamond light source, which is relatively new. I worked at a building towards the back, the ISIS neutron source. I'm a neutron scatterer, interested in the behaviour, trying to work out what exactly is magnetism. Why do you think some things become magnetic, others not? That's for another day, really. But what was the... What was quite interesting, or what always used to perplex me to some degree, was working with many scientists from all over the world, it would often come up in conversation um, issues about religion. And when people discovered, just, I mean, I wasn't trying to evangelize anyone by any means, but when people discovered that I was a, you know, a Christian with, with quite, uh, quite active uh, beliefs and went to church when I could, when I wasn't working on an experiment, I would nearly always get this question. How can you be a Christian if you're a scientist? I wish I had a PowerPoint for every time I was asked that question, and my answer would usually go something like this. There is no conflict between science and religion, or Christianity, or my faith. Again, I wish I had a PowerPoint for every time I said that. 
and also actually heard some of my colleagues say similar kind of uh, statements about their own faith and how science <coughs> might relate. Now, over time, I began to feel increasingly unsettled about that answer, to think that actually it probably wasn't quite the truth. There is actually some degree of conflict internally in myself uh, regarding science and religion. And it was about this time that I started to explore the idea of ordained ministry. And uh, one of the best things that's ever happened to me studied theology at university. Now, going into this as a scientist, I assumed that theology would actually be rather easy. And probably, I, as a, you know, I've been a Christian for a, quite a number of years, I probably knew most of it anyway. Those were my assumptions. Well, much to my delight, I found that not only was it fascinating dealing with extremely important and fundamental issues, as fundamental as anything I was doing in physics, um, it was also intellectually very rigorous and very challenging. And I have found it has remained so, as I've stayed in it for more than 10 years now. So I would say one of the best things I've ever done in my life was studying <coughs> theology. Um, and what I discovered in that time was that there's a whole series of um, academics who have devoted their careers to trying to understand the relationship between science and religion. You see, I put a brick wall up here. I, when I look back now on that phase in my life where I was saying there is no conflict between science and religion, it feels to me as though I was essentially erecting a brick wall between, between the two, internally at least, if not uh, when I speak about the disciplines themselves. Now what I discovered when I studied theology properly was this man, Ian Barber, and what he started, which is a whole academic discipline, which tends to go by the name of science and religion, or theology and science, something like that. You know, there's the idea of a pairing. Now, of course, if you go into the street and ask people, what do you think about science and religion? They probably won't tend to think in terms of a pairing. Generally, uh, the essence of the way popular imagination works, science and religion, is that they conflict. They are engaged in a fight to the death with each other. Well, what Ian Barber did, very importantly, back in 1966, when he published his famous book, Issues in Science and Religion, was to develop a series of models for how they might relate to each other. And contrary to popular belief, and, my, and these questions I was always asked, you know, how can you be a Christian if you're a scientist, surely there's conflict, um, he actually pointed out that the relationship is much more subtle than that. Now, Ian Barber's work is always the starting point. There's been an awful lot more discussion since then. Um, his four models are always the starting point, but people have discovered that there is an enormous degree of complexity in this relationship, very often dependent on what issues you're speaking about in science or theology. I'll just quickly talk you through what he said. So, um, effectively, his four models are evolutionary. You, if, you sort of start with one and work through to four, and the, the more you develop the, the relationship. The starting point is conflict. And we can all see this in examples. The trial of Galileo, Darwin controversies in the mid-19th century. Um, these are examples of why science and religion might be said just to completely disagree. There is no way in which they might ever see eye to eye on some of these basic issues. The second model, which I suppose probably what I was putting forward by saying, well, there's no conflict in my faith and science, is that of independence. They are different enterprises, and actually there's very little that they have to say to each other. That's what the independence model would suggest. The third is a bit more optimistic. It suggests that there are actually ways in which they can engage in dialogue. Now, at the moment, um, theology has, is learning a lot from science. It's not clear that the um, relationship is reciprocated, though. Dialogue here would suggest that it's a two-way conversation. They both have things to learn from each other. And then the fourth, integration. This is where science and religion actually become, or virtually, or, or <coughs> to some degree, the same discussion. Now, has anyone got to stage four? That's a good question. Perhaps we could discuss that later. But these are his four typologies, four models for the relationship between science and religion. And the reason I've shown you this is, apart from the fact that I'm giving you some of my life story here and how important this was to me, um, is that miracle and some of the answers to, you know, 
how the, do the miracles of Jesus contradict science, you can find answers which fall within each of those four categories. Such is the complexity of the issue. Now, to begin to see this, we need to do some groundwork on what is a miracle. And I apologize to those of you who are philosophers or theologians, because I'm going to start where everyone always starts, with David Hume, the 18th century Edinburgh philosopher. So this is one of the very, very old chestnuts of philosophy and theology. The reason David Hume is so useful is because he put the um, debate about miracle and its relationship with science in the clearest terms. Now, this was his definition of what a miracle is, which you can find in one of the end notes to this particular chapter. Um, and he defines it as, a miracle may be accurately defined, a transgression of a law of nature by a particular volition, will, of the deities, the will of God, or by the interposition of some invisible agent, meaning something supernatural, something that is beyond our empirical experience, anyway. Now, crucially, the way this definition works is it relies on the very ancient metaphor that underlies the law's law of nature. Now, we tend to use this as a throwaway, throwaway phrase, particularly in science. The laws of nature, we don't even think about the fact that it actually is a metaphor at the end of the day. Um, in the same way that we have human laws that regulate our behavior, this metaphor is suggesting that there are laws that regulate the behavior of the natural world. Who would do the regulating? Well, the obvious person, if you believe in such a person, is the deity. So, um, you can find a discussion or allusion to the idea that the natural world is regulated by law. Going way back to the Hebrew Bible, find it in the ancient Greek philosophers. It's a very, very ancient idea. And of course, it's a metaphor. And this is what Hume is doing. He's playing with the metaphor. So, like I said, it relies on the old juridical, legal, metaphor underlying law of nature. Now, there are two problems with this. First of all, if you read anything about Hume and his idea of the laws of nature, um, it nearly always gets critiqued quite heavily by philosophers and theologians. theologians. I'm just going to do something the same. Two of the problems that his definition faces is that um, he puts forward a stratospheric high view of the laws of nature. They can't be um, bypassed it or adjusted or revised, as science would do, but they can only be violently abused. They are so fixed and rigid that they can only be abused or transgressed. In other words, the natural world is a rigid and closed system, according to this way of thinking. Now, this may have seemed like an unreasonable conclusion back in the 18th century, when science was dominated by the almost clockwork determinism of Newton, but I would think that that is hardly the case today, when um, the determinism of the Newtonian world has been replaced by all sorts of much more open views of science. You only have to think, uh, have to look at quantum mechanics, relativity, chaos theory, complexity, emergence, and so on, and so on, and so on, to, to see that science has developed a much more open view of the world, which is much less likely to call upon a, a kind of clockwork determinism. So that's one of the problems that, that Hume's definition faces. The second is that it's actually rather incoherent in its use of the, the law of laws of nature as a metaphor. Because if you think about it, the one who makes the laws, God, is also the enforcer of the laws. Okay, that's not fine. But then God is also the breaker of the laws. So there's a sort of a lack of coherence here. But the amazing thing about this definition is that it has really stuck fast. So again, if I, if I went out on the streets of St. Andrews and asked the next passerby, um, how would you define a miracle? Chances are they would probably say something along the lines of, well, a miracle violates science or transgresses the laws of nature or so something like that. So, that, that was, so I've just been talking through that a tiny little end note from Hume's essay. He does go on to talk about the laws of nature much more carefully in the rest of the piece. This is also vulnerable, though. So this is what he says. A firm and unalterable experience has established these laws. What is that firm and unalterable experience? And he gives some examples. All men must die, that lead cannot of itself remain suspended in the air, that fire consumes wood and is extinguished by water. And so he goes on. 
Well, let's have a think about these, because actually science has moved on. Lead can float in the air, something called the Meissner effect, which the lead happens at 7.2 Kelvin. There are also types of fire that burn underwater. And this is the most speculative bit of all. Um, some of you may have heard of cybernetic immortality. It's a very controversial area of research. The idea that at some point in the future, and some of those who are, um, are working on this suggest that we may get to that point in 50 to 100 years, human memories, your entire, the entire contents of your brain, in other words, could be downloaded onto computer hardware. And assuming that we discover what makes consciousness work at that stage, that could be a form of consciousness arising from computer hardware, which, as long as no one turns the off switch, would be immortal. That's the idea. Like I said, it's extremely speculative. But if it happens, that would be, suggest that to some degree, you know, you could live forever. Whether anyone wants to live in that form, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, the point being that there are people who are already discussing ways in which humans may um, attain immortality of a sort. And I suppose the point I'm trying to make from this is that science is constantly moving. That's what science is about. It's always in progress, otherwise it's not science. It's unwise from that point of view to be too prescriptive about what we think are the laws of nature, because yesterday's miracle may end up being tomorrow's scientific law. Also, a miracle doesn't need to contradict science or transgress laws of nature. And a good example of this is Colin Humphrey's work. He's a material scientist at Cambridge who's very well known for his view that a miracle doesn't need to be, and it can be scientifically explained, but the miracle is all in the timing. And he, he illustrates this with um, his study of the book of Exodus, which, as you no doubt know, the plagues of Egypt, God sends the plagues of Egypt upon, um, uh, upon Pharaoh, hail, frogs, blood, darkness, and so on, to terrify the Egyptians so that they'll let the children of Israel and Moses go. Um, Shortly after in the story, there's the crossing of the Red Sea, where the Red Sea parts and allows, the, allows most of the Israelites to walk through. Um, Colin Humphreys explains how they, those events could be thought of as being you know, obeying natural phenomena. Okay, very remarkable phenomena, but they're not beyond the bounds of science. But the miracle is in the fact that it actually happened when it did, just when Moses and the Israelites needed it to. And a good example of this is the crossing of the River Jordan. Later on in the story, the Israelites need to cross over the River Jordan, which is in full flow, um, and God stops the flow of the Jordan, dries up, they cross over to the other side. Um, in fact, it's very well known that the Jordan does this from time to time, because it's an area of very, very high seismic activity. And further upstream from where they might have been, um, there are some very steep banks, which, when there's an earthquake, the rubble uh, to float, uh, comes down the slope into the water, stops the flow of the river for a few hours. So from that point of view, it's possible to explain this miracle scientifically. The miracle would therefore be that it happened at just the right time. So from that point of view, a miracle needn't contradict science. But since we've been looking at texts now, and specific miracles, let's go back to Hume, because he's very interesting on how to deal with evidence for a miracle. And he thinks about the resurrection, very appropriately, we're just one day after Easter Sunday. What kind of evidence would you need in order to believe that someone had been raised from the dead? The example he uses is the famous Tudor Queen, Elizabeth I, whom the history books tell us died in 1603. But let's suppose, he says, that evidence comes to light that actually she died in 1600 and then came back to life. Reigned, again, reigned for another three years, and then died again in 1603. What kind of historical evidence would convince us of this? Would we need to see the written evidence of numerous doctors or courtiers of, of good reputation? What kind of thing would convince us? Hume's point is that nothing would convince us of this preposterous story. No amount of witness testimony or or evidence would convince us of this. Now, clearly what he's doing here is kind of side-swipe at the resurrection of Jesus, but it's quite a clever one, though, because the point is, the 
of course, no one has anything invested in the resurrection of Elizabeth I, so we're far more likely to assume the kind of default position of scepticism, that dead people just don't come back to life. Of course, we may not be so sceptical when it comes to Jesus. The fact that there are so many uh, Christians in the world suggests that we are, as human beings, are not so sceptical as a race. But with Elizabeth, well, no one stands to gain anything one way or another by believing in her resurrection, so you know, we'll most likely conclude that there was some mistake or a fraud. And what he says is that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavours to establish. In other words, what he's saying here is that in order for some potential miracle to be accepted, the witness to it, the evidence, must be so persuasive and so unimpeachable that it's more plausible to believe that the miracle happened than to believe the witness might be wrong. And that's worth thinking about for a moment. To accept, to accept that a miracle happened, the probability that the evidence is wrong must be so minute that um, it's actually smaller than the probability that a miracle happened in the first place. And Hume's point, of course, is that, um, of course, no witness, testimony, or evidence is going to be so persuasive. On those grounds, we will always be sceptical. And I think he's got a point here. So you have to ask then, well, why do so many millions or billions of people believe in Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus? Well, this must come down to worldview, predispositions, presuppositions, in other words, faith. And many Christians would talk about having a living relationship with the risen Jesus. In other words, it's not just about reading texts, the Bible. So if you're indifferent, I think you're probably never going to believe on testimony, evidence alone. Now, so the question arises, you know, what, what makes a difference between Elizabeth and Jesus? It just simply has to be our predispositions, faith. Here's a bit of light relief to try to illustrate this a bit more. These are some pictures of the face of Jesus in everyday objects. Uh, top left is a, a tree branch that has been sawn away, and you can see something that looks amazingly like the top half of Jesus, and you can see some people have put some flowers and a little candle at the bottom, Clearly, this, this has been seen as significant by some people. Um, top right, that's a toasted cheese sandwich with the face of Jesus on it. Uh, bottom left is one of my favourites. This is the face of Jesus in some mould on a shower curtain. <laughs> and this was cut off and sold on eBay for several thousand dollars. Um, bottom right, you may not see it so clearly. That's the belly of a acoustic guitar with the face of Jesus in it. Now, it's amazing, of course, all the best material is on the internet, to see uh, the, what, the way that people um, uh, treat some of this material, um, often wanting to have one of these things, believing that it brings them good luck or answers prayers for them. Um, there's a certain sort of totemism in it, perhaps. But what it puts me in mind of is the famous Hindu milk miracle of 1995. This is where some... Uh, statues of the Indian uh, god Dev, uh, Ganesha in a number of temples were all seen to drink up bowls of milk, uh, milk offerings at the foot of the statue. Now straight away this was explained and even some experiments were have demonstrated that this is just simply capillary action because the, the stone that the statue is made of is porous. But it didn't deter hundreds of thousands of people worldwide from coming to see it and presenting more offerings. Um, and, you know, a revival happened as a result. In fact, uh, the same miracle was seen in a number of Hindu temples across the world, including here in Britain. So what this suggests is that even if there is a really obvious scientific explanation, it is not going to deter belief at times in miracles. In other words, Miracles don't necessarily contradict science. And this leads us to emphasize the subjective factors in trying to understand, define what a miracle is. This is a great quote from the great Friedrich Schleiermacher. He really took the subjective side of miracles to extremes. And he said, to me, all is miracle. All of the everyday things, I understand God behind them. Everything is miracle. 
Of course, there is a tension here. In trying to understand how best to define miracle, to move beyond Q, we have to take into account this subjective element against any supposed objective element. So, the subjective factors would be things like the presuppositions of the observer, when, whether such a person is more likely to believe in a thing or not, to what degree an, ele, uh, an event is seen to be remarkable or not, which is the degree of subjectivity there too, and also the underlying significance. Is there a message attached to it? Those would be subjective factors, but we need to keep those in tension with any supposed objectivity. In other words, how does this relate to things like science, the laws of nature, for instance? Did it really happen? How can we establish it? Well, if you're not careful in trying to avoid all of these uh, pitfalls, you'll end up with a totally um, useless definition like this one, a totally circular definition which doesn't tell you anything. A miracle is what a believer in miracles believes to be a miracle. That one works. That is the only definition of miracles that I know works. I will offer you a more useful definition. A miracle is a reported event which, it's claimed, was caused directly by a transcendent power. Notice there, there's nothing about science or laws of nature. In fact, the emphasis is on the fact that it's a claim. It invites us to assess a claim. And I think this is, is one of the most important points about miracles. A miracle always demands assessment, or at least the testimony for a miracle always demands assessment, on quite a number of levels. It's possible that the claim might involve a contradiction of science, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. There's a complexity here, not least the tension between subjectivity and objectivity. Well, I think I've probably said enough there, I hope, to illustrate just how complicated the question of what is a miracle is. So let's move on to the miracles of Jesus. Okay, well, our sources. Remember, we were talking with Hume about you know, evidence, witness testimony. What are the sources? Predominantly, they are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, Jesus is one of the best attested figures, uh, historical figures from antiquity, because not only do we have his, um, his existence attested to in those four Gospels, there's quite a number of other sources too, what you might call the Apocryphal Gospels, all sorts of letters from the early church, and a number of non-Christian sources too. And many of them attest to the fact that he was believed to be a miracle, miracle worker. In other words, he was widely known as a miracle worker. That's not the same as saying that he um, performed miracles. It's saying he was known as a miracle worker. So, for instance, there's this quote from the Babylonian Talmud. Jesus the Nazarene, this is just before his uh, execution, practiced sorcery and instigated and seduced Israel to idolatry. Now, whatever our previous position, I think, whether we are for or against miracles, it's fair to say that by any reasonable historical approach, Jesus was definitely known as a miracle worker. What do we do with that? Well, hopefully this will, will slowly become unpacked. But his miracles are very diverse. And if the problem of defining what a miracle is in the first place is quite complex, you'll see that trying to understand Jesus' miracles in that actually uh, muddies the water even more. So let's try to categorize some of them. First of all, they're what you might call, there are what you might call miraculous life events. Of course, the virgin birth, his baptism, when he heard a voice from heaven, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon him. Now, does that contradict science? Perhaps, but you could say that this is some kind of visionary experience, which is psychological, spiritual, but at any rate, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to uh, demonstrate whether this was within or without the boundary of the science. Um, temptation in the wilderness. According to the stories, he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Various um, supernatural things go on. Again, that could be said to be visionary. It's difficult to say. Does that contradict science? Hard to say, though, I think. Calling of disciples. In a number of cases, he appears to have supernatural knowledge. And in fact, this appears in quite a lot of the narrative. He knows more than other people, particularly about his own destiny. He has been called by God. He has a divine destiny, according to the stories. And of course, there's a sense in which he is fulfilling prophecy made hundreds of years before in the Old Testament. 
The transfiguration is, is potentially an amazing miracle. Again, though, this is where he's on the mountaintop. Um, he's transfigured in heavenly glory. His disciples see this. Well, the question, though, is this um, open to, to scientific critique, or is it actually another visionary experience? The resurrection. I will say a bit more about that later on. But this is a very, very complicated uh, problem of the resurrection and science, and what happened, what might be said to have happened. The ascension, at least taken literally, a body um, flying up into space, that, I think that's a fair candidate, candidate for breaking the rules of law of nature. But the point of me presenting this is to suggest that actually there's an awful lot of miracle in the story of Jesus, actually just in his basic life events, his public ministry. There aren't miracles um, just in, in the kind of the story, the fundamental backbone of the story, if you like. Now, what he's best known for in the tradition are his healings and exorcisms, in the sense that there are more of these than any other kinds of miracles. Um, so, you know, he's famous for having healed skin disease, such as leprosy, uh, given uh, those experiencing blindness their sight back, even raising dead people back to life. It's a famous story of the raising of Lazarus. And also, he is clearly well known as an exorcist. Lots of stories of exorcisms in the Gospels. And then there are what I would call, for want of a better title, miscellaneous miracles. I can't think of any other way of grouping them. And so I put his general supernatural knowledge in there. There's a very strange story, which I'll say a bit more about in a minute, about the withering of a fig tree, where he curses a fig tree and withers. There's another strange story about the coin in the fish's mouth, where he and Peter need to pay their taxes. Of course, they're broke. Um, so Jesus tells Peter to go and fish in the, uh, in the sea, and the first fish he pulls out will have a coin in its mouth. So those are miscellaneous miracles, but probably the, the, the most stupendous ones of all are what you might call nature miracles, which I've divided up into sea miracles and feeding miracles. This is where he seems to have some sort of supernatural control over the forces, powers of nature. So, sea miracles, stilling of the storm, where the disciples are terrified they're going to be drowned in this terrible storm on the Sea of Galilee. He simply says, peace, be still, and the waves and the wind stop. And the walking on the water, of course, is very, very famous. Um, different accounts say slightly different things. The most famous one of all is where Peter tries it, manages a few steps, and then falls in. And Jesus has to come and help him. <coughs> Feeding miracles. Um, Wedding at Cana, so that's the water into the wine miracle. Feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 are paired in some Gospels. And the miraculous catch of fish, this is where the disciples have been trying to catch some fish, fail all night. And Jesus says, well, drop your nets over the other side. They do. An enormous amount of fish arise from this, to the extent that their nets are always breaking. Now, gathering all of these together, trying to make sense of this huge diversity of miracles, there is clearly a great deal of complexity here. Different kinds of miracles, different kinds of story, but all focused <coughs> on one man. Now, interestingly, some of these stories are similar to other miracle stories told in the first century. We know of, there are sources which talk about other miracle workers in Galilee and Judea. And some of the Jesus stories are really quite similar. So clearly, you know, he fitted into the historical context. Also, some of these miracles are very similar to what happens to some of the other legendary figures in um, the Jewish milieu. So I'm thinking of people like Elijah and Elisha, the stories that are told of them in the Old Testament. Other stories, though, are unique, and particularly the sheer number of healings and exorcisms that he carries out really is quite distinctive. That, that no other historical um, figure is said to have done quite so many healings or exorcisms as Jesus is. <coughs> now, oh yes, and that's just the point I was going to make, that um, the miracles are part of the bedrock <coughs> of who Jesus is and what he is about, as far as the sources, the Gospels are concerned. If you start to think, well, I'm not sure about the miracles, I like his teachings. He said some great things. I like those. Well, I'm afraid that the Gospels really suggest that they're all part of the package. It's a package deal, really. So it's hard to kind of pick and choose. 
What do we do with that? Well, I will hopefully show you some ways through. First of all, though, the question that I've been set, do the miracles of Jesus contradict science? There are various ways you can answer this, and since I've said that I'm going to give you yes and no, I'll start with no. First of all, some of these miracles could be argued to be, well, coincidences. It just happened that the disciples had been kind of chasing this uh, mysterious shoal of fish around the lake, hadn't caught it yet, and it, they, this shoal of fish just happened to be on the other side of the boat when Jesus said, drop your nets there. And they just happened to catch it, so the miracle is in the timing. Same with the stilling of the storm. Perhaps Jesus was actually a very clever weather forecaster and just happened to realize the storm was about to die when he said, peace, be still. <coughs> so from that point of view, those miracles don't contradict science. Also, this is a very interesting uh, recent field of research, which is comparing the miracle stories of Jesus with some social, scientific, and anthropological work that's been done on folk healers in various cultures. And it's the case that there are some interesting parallels between the stories of Jesus healing and exorcising and what we know of some folk healers in some cultures. Particularly um, with, of conditions that are psychosomatic or are involving things like so social exclusion. So um, there, there are you know, interesting sort of scientific, social scientific parallels there between what Jesus is seen to do and what um, anthropologists have studied in the field. Now also, some of the miracles can just be rationalized or explained away. Um, one I've often heard for the feeding of the 5,000 is that, um, well, when everyone gathered around Jesus, saw this little boy sharing his two fish and five loaves, they all got their packed lunches out that they'd kind of hidden away <coughs> and started sharing, and soon enough, there was enough for everyone. If the miracle is about sharing, kind of, you know, stingy humans actually deciding to give up things for people, um, rather than anything uh, that kind of multiplies fish or bread. Similarly, with the walking on water, I've heard this one. Um, obviously, he was walking on a submerged sandbank. <laughs> and uh, this picture here is of a, a, a chap who has tried to rig this up with a submerged platform just under the surface. It looks pretty convincing. Um, likewise, with the resurrection, there are rationalizations of this as well, such as um, he died, his body was in the tomb, but his disciples experienced after a number of days, let's say three, um, a kind of feeling of new hope, and therefore resurrection and resurrection stories are metaphors for this kind of new hope that even though he was dead, yet his presence, his spiritual presence was with, him, was with them. That's a rationalization of the resurrection that you'll hear quite frequently. So those are ways in which you can say, no, the miracles don't contradict science. Let's have a look at some yeses. Well, actually, you can take some of the same miracles all over again and say, yes, they do contradict science. Feeding the 5,000, if you read it, a very straight reading, actually, um, Jesus fairly clearly does produce an awful lot of bread and fish out of those um, that small number, because the disciples have to gather up Lots and lots of baskets full of leftovers at the end. Walking on the water, too, would seem to be, if you read it at face value, to be a, a pretty clear breaking of the laws of nature. He has control over the law of gravity. Water into wine. Like, likewise, there is no easy way of rationalizing that one. And if you read the resurrection as actually resurrection of the dead body, then likewise. There are any number of laws of nature that that one breaks. So, yes, there clearly are ways in which you could say the miracles of Jesus do contradict science. But is it so important, though, whether or not they contradict science? And I think not as I'm pondering on this, my answer would be no, it's not actually all that important. Because apart from the fact that there are other miracles, stories that have no great uh, relationship with science, some of those ones I mentioned, Colin Humphreys, for instance, the miracle in the is in the timing, might be examples of that. All of these miracles alike, whether they, you, you say that yes, they break the laws of nature, or no, they don't, all of them point to the significance of Jesus. They are told <coughs> not simply as, oh, isn't that interesting? This is actually told, recounted in the Gospels, because the evangelists who wrote them want to tell us, tell the readers, about why this man was so significant. 
and why you might want to invest this amazing degree of faith in him. So there's a, sort of, there's a second, second level of importance to them, rather than just, did it happen? What does it, how does it relate to science? And this becomes particularly clear when you go beyond the surface reading of the miracles. And what you discover is that um, many of the, the miracle stories are actually very carefully placed and structured in the narrative, such that they inform each other, but they also inform the teachings of Jesus and the other events that go on, particularly to do with the, uh, the calling and the actions of the disciples. So in, in a gospel like Mark, which is full of miracles, um, the disciples are consistently portrayed as being uh, completely thick and unable to realize the significance of what's going on before their eyes. There's a reason Mark seems to do this. And the point being that they are very carefully structured for a reason. The teachings inform the miracles and how you understand them, and vice versa. So just to give you some examples of, of how to do this, I mean, the point is, I suppose, that what you, once you start to look at the stories in more detail, you find deeper currents than simply, did this happen or not? Does it contradict science or not? And in fact, that question of, you know, how a, sci how a miracle relates to science is really only half the story. So um, the sea miracles particularly the stilling of the storm is a good example of this, because this story parallels other stories we're told, particularly in Mark's Gospel, of exorcisms that Jesus is performing. And what you find is that the stilling of the storm is told almost like another exorcism. It's almost as though the wind and the waves have taken on um, a kind of demonic force that Jesus needs to exorcise in order to gain control. And this is of a piece with his teaching, which is spread right through Mark's Gospel, that he has come to preach the, the, the news that the kingdom of God is near at hand. In other words, there is a change of rulers about to take place. So what the story is telling us, once you start to look at the wider significance, look at the, the deeper currents, is that um, the forces of chaos, wind and waves, are to some degree representing the powers of evil, and Jesus has come to kind of change the rulership, in fact, or be involved in this change of rulership. So there's a kind of cosmic significance, is what Mark is trying to tell us about this, this, these miracles. Also, like I said, the response of the disciples is always to the forefront in these miracles. The point being, to teach those who are reading these stories, what does it mean to be a disciple? What is faith, really, given that these people of immense significance and faith got it so badly wrong. What can we learn? This, this is what's going on in, in, in the, once you start to look at the sort of deeper currents. I said that I would tell you a little bit about the, uh, the, the withering of the fig tree. It's a very strange story. Um, Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. He's hungry. He sees a fig tree. It, it's in leaf, but there are no figs, so he curses it. Now, Mark tells us that actually it wasn't the season for figs anyway. So why would Jesus expect there to be figs on it? And why does he do something so strange as to curse it? Anyway, when the next come past, past, the fig tree has withered. What's this story about? Well, if you look at the structure, you'll find that actually there's another story in between it, which is the famous scene of the cleansing of the temple, where he goes into the temple and drives out the money changers and the money lenders. The point being here, and Mark does quite a lot of this kind of structuring, that the two stories inform each other. So the fruitlessness of the fig tree and Jesus' subsequent cursing of it parallels the religious fruitlessness, according to the Gospel, of the Jerusalem temple and the reason why it was later destroyed at the hands of the Romans. So there's a very subtle kind of undercurrent going on about how one reads these, what, what the significance that one reads out of these miracles. And the point being that the question of, you know, do these contradict science? He's really only getting at the surface level. Perhaps the best example of this, the kind of deeper undercurrents, is the feeding of the 5,000. This is a very, very significant miracle of all, apart from the resurrection, because it's the only miracle which is in all four Gospels. And there is very dense symbolism in this one. It echoes the Last Supper, and therefore the Church's um, regular service, the Eucharist. There are echoes of the manna in the wilderness where God's feed to the Israelites and Moses in the wilderness. So Jesus is being portrayed as the new Moses. Um, there is material hints to the, the, the mission of the church after Easter. 
And this idea, which is in the Jewish tradition, of the Messianic banquet, the banquet in heaven, which all believers will um, kind of enjoy together with the Messiah. So it's not just about kind of, ooh, isn't that impressive? It's effectively, there's a, there's a sense in which you've got an enacted parable. And the question of, well, what really happened is only getting at sort of at the surface level here. And the long and the short of it is simply that the Gospels recorded these stories, particularly miracles, um, for the purpose of promoting faith in Jesus. And that's very obvious when you look at the, one of the endings of John's Gospel. Now, Jesus did many other signs, that is, miracles, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, these miracles, are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. In other words, whether or not they contradict science is kind of by the by, really. The miracles, the signs, are bound up with who Jesus is and how you respond to it. You are not independent, effectively. And this is going back to what I suggested about miracles, having both a subjective component and an objective component. A miracle requires an observer who has faith. Look at this text in Mark's Gospel, which is a good one illustrating this. This is where Jesus goes back to his hometown of Nazareth, preaches, teaches, they're very impressed, but they're not quite sure, because of course they know him very well. Um, the people of Nazareth took offence at him. Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honour except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. So he could do a few miracles, but not the really impressive ones. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Here's a text which more or less uh, implies just what I've been saying. That actually, miracles are not independent of those who observe them. There's a subjectivity about Jesus' miracles as told in the Gospels. The presuppositions that we observers bring to them are not irrelevant. Now, I'm just going to illustrate the difficulty that this brings, um, the miracles, into the study of Jesus as a historical being by, in the last few minutes, by talking just for two minutes about a very interesting field of research that is really mushrooming at the moment <coughs> in biblical studies, which goes by the name of the historical Jesus. And the point here is to, well, to attempt to put faith presuppositions to one side, or at least be open about them, but to treat the, the evidence that we have, the sources, as historical documents like any other, and to put them alongside other historical documents, not prejudicing some of them because we like them, because they're the New Testament, but to treat them like a historian would. So what we're trying to do here is asking who Jesus really was in human terms that we can understand as another human being like us, firmly embedded in his context as a first century Galilean. Someone that we can understand like another first century Galilean using, using the tools of history and socio-historical models. So rather like the um, scientific method to some degree, we start with evidence, we look at sources, there is some form of data analysis going on that is heavily um, disputed at the moment in the field, but to some degree it involves sifting the sources to try to determine which are the most authentic or the most trustworthy, those which have probably been um, least subject to um, embellishment, difficult phrase, uh, word to use, but which is, uh, contains the most accurate historical kernel. And then to apply socio-historical models. You see that applying the model is everything. So it's rather similar to the methodology of science to that degree. Now, the interesting thing is, there are an awful lot of people working in this field, and there are lots of models. Lots of different historical geniuses are coming out of it. And the issue of miracles is very, very difficult. Now, most scholars would acknowledge that Jesus was known as a healer and an exorcist. But what does this mean? Did he actually heal and exorcise? Well, you'll get different opinions on this. Um, one scholar I know of says that, okay, just because he was known as a miracle worker doesn't mean he actually performed any miracles. So you get a kind of a, an interesting uh, debate going on. And I'll just illustrate this with two scholars, one of whom is, a, is from St. Andrews, in fact, um, Tom Wright. Uh, two very well-known works in the historical Jesus field, one by John Dominic Crossan, which puts forward the model 
that Jesus was rather similar to a Greek philosopher in the Cynic school. Okay, so this is a socio-historical model, from the, which is, you know, it's a context, we understand this, we, we have other sources and other pieces of evidence, that means we can put together what these people thought and what they did, and it's essentially making Jesus out to be rather like a Jewish version of such a philosopher. And, the, the, you know, Crossan supports this from the text and argues the case. The interesting thing about this, as far as miracles are concerned, is that while Crossan acknowledges <coughs> that Jesus was known as a healer and an exorcist, yet he um, is really rather sceptical of the idea of resurrection. To him, resurrection is a metaphor, as I mentioned earlier on, the idea that... Uh, um, after Jesus' death, the disciples became convinced that somehow he, would, he was present with them in a spiritual sense, but didn't really happen in a bodily sense. Tom Wright, on the other hand, is very famous for having written a lot about the resurrection. His model, his socio-historical model, um, he has Jesus firmly in the mold of a Jewish prophet, uh, as in the Old Testament, preaching divine judgment on Jerusalem. <coughs> And like I said, he's particularly famous for what he's said about the resurrection. He argues that the empty tomb tradition, where the women and then later the disciples came on Easter day and found that the stone was rolled back, there was no body in the tomb. The empty tomb tradition is not very strong on its own. Likewise, the traditions that Jesus appeared to his disciples after three days are also not so strong historically on their own. But combine them, he argues, and you have a very strong historical case that Jesus actually did come back from the dead in bodily form. Now, that's, that's the, the nub of his argument. I've effectively given you two, um, two end points to the debate, because there are many others in between. The point being that these are scholars who are applying historical method, attempting to, as best they can, to use the tools of history, but when we come to miracles, what exactly happened, to what degree um, can we be objective or subjective, there is clearly a very great degree of disagreement here. So the subjectivity of miracles is coming to the fore again. Now, I think I've probably said enough, so I will conclude here and just draw together what I've said. I try to avoid being vague or non-committal. I have really tried to, but I think my answer to the question I was set do the miracles of Jesus contradict science? Really is yes and no. On the one hand, I try to present the, the point about the definition of miracle is actually very complex. There are subjective and objective angles on this, which we can't avoid. There is a yes or a no, yes and a no there simultaneously. Um, the complexity and diversity of Jesus' miracles also suggests that we have to apply a yes and a no to some of these as well. And then I started talking a little bit about the historical question and the difficulty of establishing what a miracle is and how we can understand Jesus as a miracle worker in the first century. Now, what you will have noticed, I hope, is that I've actually said very little about my own beliefs in the miracles of Jesus. But I hope that what you can see is that my question that I was set of do the miracles of Jesus contradict science is actually rather different to do I believe in the miracles of Jesus, I think that's a whole new question for a whole new talk. Thank you for listening. <laughs>